Hello, hello. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for choosing to be part of the conversation today on ways to work smarter, not only to op optimize uh, your organization, but also to uplift the people and potential of your organization at large. My name is Asia Smith, she, her pronouns, and I'm an executive leadership coach and also support our growth and community teams at Think Human. And I'm tuning in from the Washington DC metropolitan area, Maryland more specifically today, but I know we've got an international crowd with us, so let's connect. Let us know in the chat what your name is and where you're dialing in from today. Just love to see who we got in the room with us. Okay, Ray from Oregon. Okay, Chelsea from Phoenix, Kiana from Barbados. All right. Okay, I see Austin, San Diego, New York. We've got Mexico, okay. All right, well, welcome uh, to all those who just got a shout out uh, and to everyone who's sharing the space with us today. We're all really grateful to have you here. Please take from this conversation whatever you need to serve you and your growth, and please don't let the growth stop there. We definitely encourage uh, taking away, you know, from this conversation whatever it is that you need and connect with a teammate, a friend, a loved one, perhaps even a coach or a therapist to talk through it so you can take care of yourself and feel empowered to continue the discussion in your community. So we're gonna get warmed up in the chat again for today's conversation since we're talking about how orgs are navigating the current state of the world, taking care of their people and working smarter. So let us know what does working smarter mean to you or feel free to share what working smarter would look or feel like for yourself, your team and your org at large. So feel free, let's, let's get warmed up in the chat uh, for the larger conversation today. What does working smarter mean for you? What would that look like for you or your organization? Okay, from Elizabeth, gaining efficiency, efficiency through focus and effectiveness. Heather, seeing results of hard work. Utilizing team member strengths, yeah, yeah. More focus, fewer distractions. Okay, cool, cool. It's really great um, seeing folks interacting in the chat and with the conversation with the panelists today, they're gonna to add on more to this and please continue uh, with being active in the chat throughout the webinar. If you feel energized to say something, don't hesitate to share, comment and ask questions. This is all really great input so far and your presence and contribution always make the conversation richer. You might spark a thought for someone in the room or we all might learn something from what you have to say. Uh, so please continue to be active in the chat. Um, with all that being said, uh, this webinar wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for our fantastic partners and for the commitment and heartfelt work of our team and leadership at Think Human uh, to provide a safe and brave space for real conversations in the world like this one. So I'm thrilled to introduce Think Human and our partners for today's webinar before we dive in. Think Human is a leadership development organization that supports HR and learning and development leaders with implementing community-centered and experiential-based leadership programs built to support a culture of belonging. The leadership trainings that we offer, in particular our flagship programs, Leader Lab and Mini Lab, are designed to create mindset shifts and behavioral change over time that sticks. Uh, toward the end of the webinar, our poll is going to pop up so you can let us know uh, if you're interested in hearing from Think Human or our other partners on the webinar today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, really quick, uh, if anyone wants to connect with Think Human, I put my link in the chat. You'll see it again, uh, but we'd love to speak with you if you're interested in learning more. Um, next up, as far as partners, we have Agora, uh, which is a compensation software striving to put people at the center of compensation. From total rewards to equity breakdowns, Agora's groundbreaking management software provides the tools to simplify compensation in an equitable, transparent, and data-driven way for organizations and their workforces. Next up, we have PIN, which is the world's first global employee communication tool that helps companies cut through the noise to stay connected and calm through hyper-relevant communications. 
whether it's best uh, to approach a performance conversation uh, or how to nudge uh, to order a gift card for an employee's birthday or automatic outreach at key moments like the first day on the job or a promotion. Um, perhaps running your first one-on-one. -on -one. PIN is there for workplace moments, big and small. Uh, and last but not least, we have Remote, which walks the talk as a fully remote organization that's on a mission to open up the world of work for every person, business, and country. They solve one of the biggest challenges for remote organizations, which is employing anyone anywhere compliantly. Remote enables companies to simplify how they employ global talent with disruptive global payroll, tax, HR, and compliance solutions for distributed teams. So thanks again uh, to our partners uh, and also to our amazing panel, who you'll all meet shortly for helping us bring this event to life. Before we get into the webinar, we also want to share an artistic moment uh, as we clear our minds and settle in for this conversation. And we hope that this helps you feel grounded uh, and open for today's discussion. So blessing us with his gifts today, we have Chris Hatch. Masking common but unspoken truth inside of body moving grooves is what drives Chris as a songwriter, producer, and artist. As a multi-instrumentalist, his origins in Nashville, Tennessee immersed him in a wealth of diverse musical talent, shaping his genre bending sound. A mix of soul, rock, hip hop, R&B, and jazz, Chris pulls in various influences with each track. His musical influences begin with gospel roots in church and expand with a wide range of exposure, including Kanye West, Kings of Leon, Paramore, and Prince. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop talking <laughs> and pass it over to Chris. So Chris, over to you. Wow, best intro I've ever gotten. Uh, so glad to be here with each and every single one of you all. Uh, glad to you know, provide some music. So I'm gonna sing a song of mine called Sway. I'd love for you guys to sway with me and uh, hang out and have a good time. So I'll just kick it off. I'm taking away at these calendar days, wondering when I'm gonna get back to my ways, back to my life and back to my bay. Hey. I took a flight and I landed in Rome, while everyone else was staying in at home, living in a world no one has ever known. But when in doubt, I'm thinking now things about you. Like how we used to dance all alone in your room. I'm fighting for the world and I'm fighting it back to you. We used to rumba and hit that cha cha back in Cuba with my lover. To the Boloca, Kundo to go, me guitar right. Right now I wanna own ya. Whoa, oh, oh. So would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you? Any Stevie Wonder fans in the house? Uh, you make my soul a burning fire. You're getting to be my one desire. You're getting to be all that matters to me. I hope and pray each day I live. A little more love I have to give. A little more love that's devoted and true. Cause all I do is think about you. Uh, is think about you. I think about you all I do. About you, uh, so would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you come on, come on? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you sway, sway, sway with me? Would you? Awesome. My name is Chris Hatch. It's been an absolute pleasure to kick it with you guys. I'll drop a link in the chat. Thank you, Chris. I was over here swaying. So 
So oh, yeah. you just set the vibe, yes. And I hope everyone's able to sway in the rest of the week. So thank you so much for your time. Welcome, 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 everyone. My name is Hakemia Jackson, Global Executive Coach, DI Board Advisor, and CEO of Divinely Powered. And today I am your Think Human moderator. I missed y'all. And I'm so happy to be back here with you today to talk about this very important topic that we do not want you to sway on, by the way. <laughs> During this era of unprecedented instability to optimize people, operations, and talent management, it requires you to question everything. To fully embrace the future of work, you must welcome the new insights and thoughts and capabilities of your talent in order for your organization to thrive in this changing landscape. To thrive, your organization must take a human approach to rethinking and rebuilding work to prioritize people above all else. I want to share something with you. An overwhelming 96% of respondents to a recent annual Deloitte Human Capital Trends survey said that organizations are responsible for employees' well-being. 96% of responders said that they're responsible, but only 79%, I'm sorry, 79% said that well being isn't integrated into their workplace. Redesigning your physical and digital environment matters. Workers' personal preferences and needs, they matter. Your organization can't be so stiff to change that we actively reject what the workplace is evolving into. The old adage of grow or die is true, and it is very real in this day and age. It matters. It doesn't mean that you have to think bigger and larger. It just means that organizations have to be thirsty for non-traditional innovative practices. We have to evaluate on a fairly regular basis if you want to stay responsive and flexible during this time. Or evaluate, do you want to stay rigid and frozen towards the need of the people? We have thought leaders here today with us that's going to share their expertise and their wisdom. And I'm so excited to introduce Lauren, head of growth of Think Human, Simone, people and workplace specialist at Agora, Amanda, director of people enablement at Remote, my girl Stacy, head of employee experience. And so starting with you, Stacy. What does working smarter from your perspective look like in this day and age? Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a huge one. And I think what we've talked a lot about, I mean, to me, it's really that we're moving from this idea that there's like a, a one size fits all approach to what that answer is to something where it really is more personalized, more tailored, um, really taking on the idea that you cannot do everything, your team and company cannot do everything. So what are you prioritizing? What are you saying no to? Um, you know, what are you really like focusing on and, and providing that clarity of focus for people on? Um, and I think it's funny for whatever reason, it's, this is popped into my mind earlier today was that, you know, when we talk about work, sometimes we're saying like, oh, it's, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Okay. Mm -hmm. A marathon still has an ending, right? Like we cannot work people as though there is no end in sight. So I think there's also this idea of like putting in breaks, um, you know, creating time for people to stop and reflect and get a breath that isn't on them to go take a vacation and then come back to a pile of work, right? And so like, as an example, one of the things which was just, I think last week at PIN, we have what we call reflection week that we do every quarter where all of the internal meetings are canceled. People have a stipend to go do something that they, and take, you know, take the time off to reflect, think about what they learned over the quarter, do something that's relaxing. And like, you have to build in those kind of pauses and time for people to kind of compile like and think about and process, okay, this is what happened. Great. Now let me like prep myself for the next phase. So I think it's like a combination of so many different things that can get you there. I totally agree with you, Stacey. 
What about the rest of the panelists? What does working smarter in this time frame look like? I really think about leaning heavily into your strengths in order to work smarter. I think when times are uncertain and there is just a lot of uncertainty surrounding us, it's very easy to start to think about what am I lacking? Where are my gaps? Where can I work to evolve? But in order to work smarter, I think just leaning into those strengths and trusting your team around you that where I may have a gap, someone is really strong and coming together in that way is such an empowering way to be more efficient as a team. It's incredibly important when you're just trying to work smarter and get things done. Yes. And it's a, it's a vulnerable place to be to say, hey, you know what? I'm not strong here, but I'm going to extend this or delegate this to someone who I know is. That speaks a lot, it speaks volumes as a leader. You know, something that's like hitting really home for me on this topic is like really doing self-reflection as, as an employee on how you work best and like what your natural rhythm is when you like flow creatively, when, when you best like can do like sit down focused work. And I think it's, it's on the individual to do that self-reflection and then the organization to be flexible in the way that you approach your work so that you can, I think like Simone, to, to your point, like leverage your strengths. Like we all have these superpowers. We all have these like ways that we work best naturally. And when we're like fighting against those, we're going upstream. And so like, let go, accept that you're a human being and not a computer and find a way to set up your world that works for you, not like against you or not having to squeeze in. Right, right. Yeah, I think... Everyone said it beautifully so far, but I just want to reiterate what Stacy mentioned of just listening to your employees. Um, I think it doesn't even just have to be your team, the people team or HR team that you have. It doesn't just have to be leadership, really just taking advantage of the employees who are engaged and want to share what they would like to see done differently, what they need to do their best work, um, kind of, you know, allowing them to bring the data to you. And then you can go through it and see how, how you can support them best because that's what's going to ultimately allow your business to achieve the goals and the outcomes that they want to achieve. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amanda. And I want to share, uh, Ellie said, working smarter also means to recognize where your neurodiversity can be a benefit rather than a symptom. That is huge. Has there ever been a time where, you know, Lauren talked about having this superpower? Um, and I know we've talked about it before, where you know that you have this skill and capabilities, but the environment or the work culture isn't accepting of it or isn't flexible enough. What happened to you in that moment? And what did you do to uh, overcome that, that misunderstanding or their inability to accept the skill that, that could be beneficial for the team and the organization? When you say that, it kind of makes me laugh because the first thing that comes to mind is that I am horrible at taking my own advice, but I really do well when I'm able to support someone else in that way. So for me, when I've been presented with a situation where maybe I'm feeling like my superpower isn't being recognized or I don't currently have the space for my superpower to thrive, I try and empower someone else to bring out their superpower. And then I watch how they're able to navigate certain obstacles and how I can help them overcome those obstacles. And then I try and repeat it myself, but doing it right away on my own is definitely not my strength. So supporting others in doing that and then kind of mirroring those behaviors has been really helpful for me. Yes, I like that. Yeah, I think on my side, it's more, it's also just communicating with the team or your manager, whoever it is that you feel comfortable speaking with, who's also involved in the project or in your work and just sharing what you feel you can contribute in a different way, maybe um, bringing that new perspective um, and just having an open conversation about it uh, can be really helpful. And it's typically what I do. If I feel like I'm not able to contribute how I want to, it's just kind of overcoming that a little bit, almost like an insecurity of 
is it, is it me? Right. <laughs> is, it, is it everyone else? And then really just talking that through with someone I feel comfortable with um, and, and moving forward and deciding next steps um, after that. Thank you for sharing, Amanda. I'd say, I think one of my superpowers is feedback, but a lot of times people don't actually want feedback <laughs> or they, or they don't, you know, they need it in a specific way or something like that. So I think, you know, I had a, I have had the experience where I have like, oh, people want feedback and I give them the feedback and, and it didn't land the way I thought it would. So I think my adjustment over time has been really to like, be more clear about like, what kind of things are going to be helpful for you? Cause I can give you feedback that I think is going to be helpful, but what is it that you're actually wanting? What do you want to learn from the feedback? How can I make it something that's useful for you? And then always, I always check in with people after I give feedback, like, was that useful? Can you tell me how I can give more useful feedback? for you in the future. And so always just like keeping that loop going and trying to make sure I'm doing it in a way that's going to be helpful for the, for the person who requested it. Yeah. I, and I've been in, you know, that situation where, um, you shared feedback and the people weren't prepared to, to receive it and it just got crossed. And, you know, if we're thinking from a, if you're a part of an underrepresented group, you may be getting feedback that, oh, everything's good, good, good. And we're not really getting growth or developmental feedback to get me to that next level because of whatever else that person may be afraid of sharing or, or dealing with. Can anyone uh, speak to that? Have you ever been in that situation or, or heard of those situations and, and how was that handled? I don't know if I've been in that specific situation, but I've definitely had um, myself and other managers and leaders or just a team member be a little uncertain or nervous and hesitant to share constructive feedback. I think it can be, giving it is also not easy. Receiving yes. it can also not be easy and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, something that we recommend doing is one asking, is it okay if I share feedback with you now? Or how would you like me to share it? Uh, some people might be having a really bad day and it might not be the best day to share that constructive feedback. So really just making sure they're in the right frame of mind and right moment for themselves to share that. And then um, something that I tend to do with, um, depending on the individual, some people like me to write it down first and then have a discussion after they've had time to process it. Other people prefer to just have a conversation, but I always like Stacey check in afterwards um, because feedback is something that takes time to process and absorb a lot of times and also understand not just the feedback, but how you can apply that moving forward. So what, ac what actionable steps can you take from that feedback to improve? Um, some people might disagree with the feedback too, and that's okay. Um, and, and, and it opens up that conversation and discussion. Thank you for sharing, Amanda. Wendy says, asking the way Amanda is describing is a form of consent. It also sets the conversation up for success. Feedback is a two-way. And if the receiver can't take it in, it's not effective. Yes, well said, Wendy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Lauren, did I cut you off? Oh, okay. I thought you were coming off you. <laughs> so with that, you know, thinking about all of the different experiences that you all possess here on the webinar, what has motivated you to stay in this space? I, we talked about this before and it occurred to me afterwards, I said that it was really like this kind of unleashing of a sense of self and freedom, but I didn't really know what it was. And I think after thinking about it more, I think I realized that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this real mm -hmm. sense of like, okay, we kind of need to, the rule book doesn't apply anymore. The way we've done it isn't the way we're going to do it. And because we can't. And there was this sense of like, oh, okay, the constraints are off. There is an opportunity for true creativity. There is an opportunity because we're seeing this as a real like people focus, like, 
this is my time to shine and to like get creative and do things. And, you know, I was like, yes. And so I think that that's the thing for me that really kind of reinvigorated, be, reinvigorated me because I think I, you know, it kind of hit a point where it was like, what is there, what can I do here? Like what impact am I making? And it was just this massive shift to, you know, the sense of freedom and, and working at PIN where I was creating these communications that we're using internally and in policies and programs and then sharing them externally, you know, open source and like putting these things out. And I was like, yes, this is the impact. This is the freedom. This is the time where I actually, you know, can say traditional HR is, is out and I'm not mm -hmm. following that anymore. And I, and I think that was, it just really brought me back to life in this career, I think. Mm -hmm. Giving you that freedom, freedom to explore, freedom to be, freedom to, to implement new ways and practices, people practices. I love that. Stacy, you're so spot on. Like I, I, for me, I feel exactly the same and I'm just like invigorated and excited at like the, the opportunity that we have right now to make so much long-term systemic change in this space. Like the pandemic shook it up, it threw the rule book out. And like right now we're kind of still, I think, you know, playing jazz. There's a bit of like, is there so much flexibility? We're trying lots of things. And at one point, you know, it'll restabilize and we'll have a true new normal. And so I think there's, there's a moment here where we can like hyper jump forward into a new world that I don't know if it would have been possible if we hadn't had that massive shift and the rule book flew out. Mm. For me, that's what like gets me so excited to do this work every day is we just, we have an opportunity. We have a moment in time and, and uh, like everybody on this call, people listening in and like doing this work, you're moving this forward. You're changing the world. Yes. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Shaping history. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on my side, um, you know, especially during the pandemic, remote has employees all around the world. And I know some countries were a little more relaxed with pandemic um, and COVID restrictions, and some were really, really strong. And, and some people couldn't leave their homes or they couldn't, you know, weren't able to express themselves as they normally would. And so the community that we saw form and, and build probably at an accelerated pace at remote was really outstanding to see. And to that just motivates me to want to continue that as well as um, build upon it and enable that community to support each other to make remote work work for everyone. Um, make sure that everyone has that, that opportunity and, um, and that they're able to enjoy what they need personally as well as professionally with our company. And that's one of the similar threads I've heard throughout our conversations is just building the community, the importance of community. Lauren yeah. talked about making community a norm, a, a societal shift in community and not individualism. And we'll go back to that one. I want to bring Simone in. I seen you came off me before I started talking, um, but we'll, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just quickly going to say, I really, service is such an important part of my life. And mm -hmm. the pandemic really highlighted that without people, an organization really has nothing. An organization can't thrive, can't grow without taking care of people. And in going through such a scary, and I know we hear it all the time, but unprecedented time yeah. and being able to serve people at our most kind of fragile and vulnerable state, I really realized that what, there's no real truer way to, to incorporate service into your day-to-day -day life. And so for me, it's just doubling down on, I can't leave this space because I feel that there's a need and this is my way to serve and show up on a daily basis. So it just really reinforced that people is where I want to continue to grow my career. Yeah, yeah. I hear looking at, human capital management as a way to leave a legacy and an impact and not to just check a box to truly build back to you Lauren that community that makes a difference throughout generations and globally 
So what are your thoughts there, Lauren? I know we talked about it um, in our one-on-ones about just how the human builds community and you know the, the steps and processes and the importance of it in our day-to-day for our talent. Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about, I think was, you know, a lot about this needed shift from like a truly like individualistic, like, you know, my career, my needs, like my success um, to, I think the pandemic kind of really brought us all together, like into community that we are deeply interconnected to each other and the well being of each other. And I think this especially applies to an organization, like the overall organization is only functioning as effectively or in a state of, of well being or health as like the whole as the whole community and so shifting and looking at that in more of a more of a global perspective instead of an individualistic perspective and like how on the whole can we care for each other and you know keep ourselves um safe and supported and uh healthy like through these times i think gets us in more of a long term mentality rather than like short-term gains we need to focus on how to how do we sustain our people and like lift our people up for the long term Stacey I see you shaking your head what resonated with you or what Laura mentioned well I think so just you know from some of the things that I've been going through in the past few months have caused me to like do this stop and reflect moment and and I think, you know, I, I, the, the moment that I had, I was like, I'm the little dog cartoon meme drinking my coffee in a building that's on fire, like, <laughs> you know, and saying everything's okay. Right. I was like, because I thought about it and I don't, you know, no one needs to reveal anything they don't want to, or, you know, people in the chat can add, but I was like, okay, let me think about this since the beginning of 2020, um, who's lost a job? Oh, me. Okay. Um, who's had to move or buy a house? Me. Okay, cool. Who's had ongoing or new health challenges? Me. Uh, who's lost a loved one? Me. Who's, you know, um, been dealing, been directly impacted by war or civil unrest? You know, um, not me on that necessarily, but it's, it's out there. Um, who's had their uh, constitutional rights taken away or is worried about that happening? Oh, me. Like, mm-hmm. there's so many things that are like the most stressful things and you kind of don't have a chance to process that when it's happening and you're just surviving and getting to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And then you stop and you're like, that is a lot of stuff actually. And, you know, I know that I'm not you unique in that. And so I think you know, there is this sense of like, oh, people are stressed and they're burnt out and we have to address that, right? And I started thinking like, is it stress or is it trauma and grief, right? Mm. And the kind of response, and it is, it's trauma and grief. It's not just stress. It's not just burnout. It's trauma and grief. Yes. And I think what also like why that all kind of comes together for me is that the response, a community responds differently your people respond differently when to trauma and grief. Like you come together in a different way. You see each other with a different lens. It's more flexible. You're supportive. You're empathetic. And it's it's just that it's a very different kind of coming together and community building. And to me, like that's more of where we're at or where we kind of need to be, um, you know, individually and as organizations is putting this lens on it of like, this isn't just about stress. This isn't just about how that sits in a person's mind and body. It's really this much larger collective thing that we're experiencing and we need to support one another. Um, And a lot of that has to do with things we've talked about. That has to do with personalization. It has to do with flexibility. It has to, you know, all of these things because the experience is, is so much that you you have to see see people um and and cater to to what is happening um to all of us collectively so i think it's just it really it speaks to me on kind of all of those levels that how how impactful um 
the moment we're in is and how much people have been through and and how much we can truly be doing to support one another. Yes, you you said so much that I can go in so many different directions, but I thank you and Wendy does as well. So this is huge. Thanks for bringing this up, Stacey. You said a lot, but when you said you have to see people, seeing people takes time and patience and you have to step outside of yourself, self-preservation for self, as well as the organization to see people and to see all of their humanity. Thank you so much, Stacey, for, for sharing. Uh, Amanda, I, I think I interrupted you, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I think Stacey shared I mean, it's just incredible. I think we're all like, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I would say that, you know, it's, I think we're past the point where people expect everyone to just leave their personal lives and emotions outside of work. And Simone, I think you even mentioned a little bit of this earlier when we were talking, but it's okay to recognize that people might need time or people might need space, or they may be a little less productive during these times if they are choosing to work. Um, and that's okay. And so it's, it's really recognizing that we're not expecting people to leave all their emotions and everything that's going on in the world or in their life specifically at the door. It's giving them that space to choose how they want to process it and how they want to move forward. And sometimes that's allowing people to take some time off work. Sometimes it's allowing them a little more flexibility in their work. And sometimes it's um, just asking them, just let us know what you need mm -hmm. and you have it, right? And, and really opening up that door. Everyone processes things differently and I've definitely experienced some people who prefer to be at work because it helps, you know, give them something to look forward to or take their mind off of it for a little bit. And then I've had a lot of people also say, I just need us to step away for a moment. I'm really upset or a lot's going on and that's okay too. So it's really recognizing how we can support them that way. And if you, I've seen, if you do that and you, you address that individual need, they come back or once they um, kind of feel more like themselves a little bit or are ready to commit fully to work, they come back even more motivated, even more engaged, and even more just um, loyal to the company as well. Yeah, they do. Um, uh, Susan says, first we manage people, then we manage a company. Thank you so much. Lauren, I see your, your, uh, your fur baby over there wants to join the webinar. So we're gonna make sure we pull your fur baby in for the next question. She's very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had a comment here. Us being able to reflect and process um, could be a, a privilege to some. We may have some smaller or boutique sized organizations here on the line, and they may say, I don't have the bandwidth, I don't have the people, right? What do you say to them? How can we encourage them? I know this is probably not what they want to hear, but you have to make the time um, at some point. I think a lot hmm. of times in the people space, especially, or as a leader, you put everyone else before you and you want to address everyone first. And we sometimes forget about, about ourselves and it's just finding a small pocket for you to have that moment. Um, whether it's, it's in your work schedule, it's when you finish work, it's during, if you go on a walk and it's during that time. Um, but I think it's really important to take care of ourselves and have that moment. If everyone's not able to take a day off every quarter or something, um, it's just finding maybe a smaller version of that and, and making it apply to that, um, to your organization and what would work best for your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Amanda. I think, you know, it is kind of the hard truth that you like, you're going to have to take that time whether it gets forced to you because you've burnt yourself completely out and then you're in like a situation that you have a lot less control over because you've already gone over that line or you take care of it now, you deprioritize something that mm. may not be like as high of a priority as your own mental health and well-being which I guarantee it is, you know, that's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lower, whatever you choose is a lower priority than that because you, you lose the ability to do anything when you hit that burnout moment and, and lose it. And I think it's part of like, 
the thinking long term, even during moments of like crisis, mm -hmm. we have to think, how do I make this work over time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would also add that you're setting the example for anyone else in your company if you do that. Yes, totally, Amanda. That's but, so true. And, oh, go ahead, Samantha. No, I was just going to say to that point, that's so true. And it's incredibly important, I think, to make space for transparency with your team. I think that mm -hmm. as people, people, it is so easy to really try and show up for your team every day while also making sure that you aren't letting your own vulnerabilities seep into your interactions. But I think that that's so human and it creates an experience in which like the world is happening to me too. You know, similarly to how your therapist probably has to go see their therapist after talking mm -hmm. to you. It's like, that's a very real thing. You know, it's the world's happening to me too. And I think that when you open up that space for vulnerability, there creates, it creates so much trust amongst the team, the organization. So then when you do need to take that day, you need to take that time to what you said, Amanda, somebody saying, oh, she's setting the example. She's actually acting on what she speaks about to us. And I think that's so important. And I think it also, it highlights, I think something that Lauren had said earlier about short-term versus long-term yes. thinking, you know? Um, and as someone who has definitely reached the level of like extreme burnout, that is not recoverable by a one week, two week vacation. That's not, mm -hmm. that's months, that's maybe years. You know what I mean? So if you are pushing, you know, yourself, your team, you know, up to that extent, the, in the long term, you are not doing anyone any favors. And, it, and the, the amount of time that it's going to take to come back from that is far greater um, than the amount of time that you could put in, you know, just along the way to make sure that people can't, you, you don't get to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Lauren, when you said you have to deprioritize, I'm pretty sure that gave a couple of leaders here, oh my God, deprioritize? Guess what? It won't be the first time. COVID made you deprioritize. George Floyd being social injustice, race, that made you deprioritize right? So it is possible when you take ownership and accountability of your talent and your organization. And it doesn't always have to be a crisis that causes that to happen. Exactly. That, 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 <laughs> is, that is, yeah, actually strategically think about it. <laughs> Jacqueline said, yes, Lauren, nailed it on the head. Yes, yes, she did. <laughs> so, you know, many companies, Leo, even though we may heal on the outside, the scars are still there and reminds us sometimes. Thank you so much, Leo, for sharing. Um, you know, you're not the only ones going through it, similar to what Simone said. Your organization is not even. We've all experienced it. We've all experienced some type of loss, change, or shift. What do we do to establish a firm foundation for leaders who at this moment feel ill-prepared for this new age of, of work as well as leadership? I can just say quickly that no one knows everything. Don't worry, <laughs> don't panic. No one has all the answers and you're not expected to. Um, we're all still figuring out the best way for ourselves to work, for an organization to work, for your team to work. So take a step back and, and listen to your team. You can see what other places are doing, but ultimately it needs to be um, the decisions that you make um, as an organization need to reflect your values, your mission, your goals as a business and what you want to represent to your employees and your people. So, um, you know, start at the very, very beginning of it all and, and, just know that things can adapt and adjust. Whatever you decide now, is does it have, mean it has to be set in stone for 10 years or five years or even six months? We've definitely changed things at remote within a few months if we notice, hey, it's just not working the way we wanted it to. And we're not receiving the success or the outcomes that we wanted. So um, use your community, use your peers and use the employees that you have and, and really listen to them to understand what they're looking for. Because you might think that they really want this one benefit or flexibility or something specific. And 
it's actually lower on their list than you originally thought. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know what you made me think of, Amanda, um, when you said it may not work, it may have worked, but for that short period of time. Yeah, we have to absolutely. realize that the, the, this, how, the speed of change is happening so rapidly. Things may change as you are implementing and being okay with that and accepting that and also recognizing that your talent instead of throwing in a perk or an initiative allow their role to be the motivator allow them to operate in that sense of fulfillment and and purpose it is worth it trust and believe it and they need it now <laughs> and if you listen to them there will be so much more buy in across the organization into what you implement because you're taking it specifically from your employees um, and you're hopefully implementing something that really matters to them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, let go of control hmm. in a way. Like let it flow. We need to be more fluid right now in like this really wild moment of change that we're in. And like, I think people and companies, like when we get into moments of, crisis or shifts or instability, our gut reaction is to like grip on. as hard as we can, control every factor that we can. It's all out of your control. <laughs> it really like, like in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's all out of your control. Let go, let it flow and like be compassionate and caring and it will work out. I think also there's this sense, you know, I, within HR and I think for a lot of managers of just like not to Amanda's point, not getting anything wrong, you know, like not, not saying anything wrong, doing anything wrong, like putting, putting out, a, you know, a policy that somehow um, isn't hundred percent like perfect. And, and then we, that prevents us, I think, from doing a lot of things, right? Like, so right. we don't, we don't experiment, we don't try things. And I think it's, it's great to actually not try to get everything, you know, a hundred percent done, put something out at 50% and say, this is an experiment or, you know, this is what we're trying. Um, and we're going to ask for your, we're going to try it for three months and then we're going to ask for your feedback and we'll, you know, and it doesn't, it, it's oh, not always all or nothing. And I feel like that oh, a lot I like that. we have that sense of like, it's all or nothing. Um, and it, it's not, you know, I think it, it's like, be, be more open to just tr trying things and failing and experimenting and, you know, moving, moving on. And that's I like one that. of Go the ahead. best ways, I was just gonna say, it's one of the best ways to create that psychological safety in your organization, as well as if someone, if a manager or leader is always putting out something that is deemed as perfect or just that's the way it is and there's no ad adapting it or iterations, everyone's going to assume that they need to perform that way as well. And so, um, you know, it really instills a lot of psychological safety if you're able to show that you're open to the feedback, that you're open to changing it, that you know that this might not work or that it might need to change. Um, or it might just not um, be the best option for your, your organization. Yeah. And it, it opens up space for your humanity to live. And to me, that's important. And I always, when I'm coaching executives, I say, get off of this right or wrong trip. What's the best direction to take at this point in time with the information that you have at this moment? What's the best? and move forward from there. And so when talking about moving forward, we wanna move forward, we wanna grow. So what are some suggestions that you have for organizations uh, who, who may have the budget or may not have the budget to implement some of these new practices or innovative approaches, throwing out the rule book, right? From Lauren's perspective, uh, what are those suggestions? I think the first thing I would say, especially when we're talking about maybe not having the resources, you always have people and people are your number one resource. And so I would really mm -hmm. say foster and uplift the teachers among you. And everyone is a teacher. Everyone has that within them. Everyone has different gifts and really create the space to allow the teachers in your organization to thrive. I think that would be the number one. And it's like, 
I don't have, I don't have a dollar for this budget, but I do have what people and you will always have people. And as long as you've taken care of people in the back and you've really fostered their development, they're going to want to give back to the organization in that way. You're all so kind. <laughs> so respectful of each other. Let me wait to see. <laughs> Go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, I think to Simone's point too is something I've learned is, you know, of course, listening to employees, I've said that a lot, I think in this call, but um, it's really important to listen to them and, and understand what they're looking for. And it doesn't have to always be an engagement survey or a form. It can just be providing a space for them to share their thoughts on anything that you introduce to the company that you're working on, that you're thinking about. Um, so we have provided a really nice, um, I'd like to think a really nice open space for employees to give their thoughts on a, on a topic, even if it's completely outside of their normal day-to-day -day job. Um, and that's how you get that buy-in. But the other thing is I've definitely worked for companies that are really tight on budget and you don't have anything, but never say no immediately. Think about, is there a different way we could do it where it won't cost us as much money or um, someone just, an employee brought something to us and, you know, my immediate reaction from previous experience used to be, no, we can't do it. And now it's, let me think about it. Let me see if there's a way we could do that. If it could support our employees, if it could enable people, um, and understand, you know, just thinking creatively and, and very basics, very simple. Um, I'm a big fan of simple approaches first, and then you can always iterate on them and they become a little more layered. I love what you said, Amanda. I think there's a lot, like so many creative ways that we can go about like navigating this without budget or like creating budget through ROI, like actually looking at the impact, the things that, that we could implement and seeing like how that spreads across, not only like if one person came and said, Hey, I kind of need this thing. If we help them adapt to that, like how many people did they touch and like kind of spread that cost across like everybody within their team or in their realm. Um, and so there's just a lot of different ways to, to, to think about it. And then, you know, thinking about you invest now and it, you know, pays back over time, you know, dividends. It's just like thinking long-term versus short. I know I've said it a few times, but I, I think that's really the shift we have to get into. That it also occurs to me too, um, in in terms of budget. I think a lot of times, the the money there's money, right? It's just you've decided to spend it on something else, and that's a decision, <laughs> you know. And and if you want to take that money and prioritize it in a different way, um, that's also a decision, right? So I think sometimes it's there. There is the opportunity to to play with those things a bit and not just accept that like oh well you know especially with i think people teams often it feels very hard to get any kind of money for things because it's not always the easiest to say like this is what our our money got us right um but i think you know you can you can push on that and and we're learning more and more about what what the the different kinds of programs, what the kind of impact they have on productivity and on engagement and on retention and all of these kinds of things that you know we can use to to point to. Um, but you know it, it it does take some some time and dedication and experimentation to to see um, how how the different things you experiment with might play out. But I would I would I guess I would tell people to like push back on that a little bit, maybe question that a little bit if the if the resources maybe are there or can be found. Um, and especially if it's framed in terms of like, let's just try this thing. Let's just see um, and go from there. Like really just have a more experimental mindset and yeah. be curious about it. Yeah, yeah. Simon Sinek says exercise ferocious curiosity. And so with that, I want to, we're going to do a quick little poll before our last question. Time is going by so fast. We only have a couple of minutes. 
which of these organizations you would love to connect with and continue the conversation. Also, be sure to connect with these experts via LinkedIn as well to learn more about how do I optimize my people as well as my organization. So I'll give you 10 more seconds. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for connecting. And with that, we are towards the tail end of our webinar. And if you could think of just one thing that you want this audience to walk away with, to embolden them, to be change agents, to create their history today for the future, what would that be? Yeah, I think it is. Oh, are you asking us? Yes. Yeah. Yes, no. I was like, oh, I just saw, I was like, oh, people are answering in the chat. So great. I was just going to go with their answer. <laughs> um, well, no, I think, I mean, it really is like this, what we've talked about is we have a really incredible moment in time to not feel beholden to doing things the way that they've been done, to having these kinds of constraints on us. And it's like, take advantage of that, live in that moment to really like try something different, you know, think about how you can support people in a, in a different way, in a more commu community-based way um, with, with that kind of lens on it and really like have that that idea about creating something that is not one size fits all and that is yes. personalized and is customized and and recognizes you know people's humanity and, and from a empathetic and uh, curious mindset um and that's really i think that's what i would kind of send people out with <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah, I would say actively and thoughtfully just create space for possibility, whatever that possibility may be. Nothing needs to be so stringent that you can't change it. Just create that space within your organization and you will be really overcome with what ends up coming from the people very organically. So just open up that space and do it consistently and actively and as thoughtfully as possible. Mm. Simone Les Brown says, have a mindset of possibilities. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I think on a, on a very similar theme, like don't let yourself like be constrained to the boxes that we've defined in the past. Like those like don't really exist anymore. That's, that's gone. Like now is time to play. Now it's like, Ooh, I like that. To, to, to explore and try new things and see what happens. Like that's, that's how, that's the only way we'll know what works. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure that out. Like, and all of us are. And so like, give yourself compassion as you're experimenting, as you're putting things in place. If things don't work fine, try something else. It's all good. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yes. What box Lauren? If I build <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I mean, I think everyone said it really well. The only other thing I would say is if it feels really overwhelming or you're just not sure where to start, just think of small iterations or something small that you can implement first and try it out. You know, it doesn't have to be this huge, big initiative that you're introducing. It could be something really small. Yes. And I think once you start doing that, you get a little more comfortable with trying new things and, and adapting and adjusting and, um, and just, you know, what do you want your employees to say about your company or about their work? How do you want them to feel when they show up to work? Think mm -hmm. about those questions and you can ask them as well. And I, I keep saying, ask your employees. The other thing is that they'll give you feedback that maybe you don't agree with, or maybe it's not the right decision for the business. And it's okay to also respond with, I don't, I don't think that's the right direction and explain why. Yeah, um, but it does open up that door and, and, and show everyone where you can go. Yes, thank you so much, Amanda. And on that note, I wanna say thank you to Leo. He said, y'all are in my heart. Thank you for this. Stacy, as well as Michael, great insight, quite enlightening. Thank you all so much for your time. 
Thank you for also sharing your wisdom with our community and community. Thank you for sharing your wisdom to us as well. And so we look forward to having you back again. Please be sure to connect with these amazing organizations and continue to allow your light to shine and maintain a mindset of possibility. Bye.